us this morning uh, amounts to Act 138. Uh, that we we both both sides have been working on. Uh, I think to sort of together, but separately. Uh, we had our joint meeting, and <clears throat> and Michael Michael uh, O'Grady, our legislative council person, and Steve uh, Collier from the agency of Ag have been working to. Uh, to put a package together that we can present to our negotiators uh, that will be taking up uh, changes to Act 138 in the near future, <clears throat> and I think it's um, I think the we've done a pretty good job of putting uh, this together, and Michael and Steve certainly uh, worked hard honoring our wishes and making sure everything uh, was in order and, and corrected, uh, correct. Um, I, before we get into, uh, I guess Michael will be presenting this uh, to us. And before we get into that, are there any uh, questions of any of the members, uh, Carolyn, did you have anything from the house side? Nope, Bobby, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the work that Michael did on this and uh, glad we've come up with what we think is a solution. I think this is excellent and it's good to see everybody's smiling faces this morning. So um, thank you all and especially special thanks to Mike yeah. for, uh, for fixing things. Well. Uh, Michael, are you with us yet? He is. I am. Yeah. And, uh, well, do any of the members have anything to add uh, before we get started? If, if not, uh, we will uh, proceed. Uh, do you want to take us through the, uh, the proposed amendment, Michael? Sure. Uh, Linda, could you put it on the screen? <clears throat> so the first section is the Dairy Assistance Program, and the first three changes relate to the application deadline. You'll see on page two that the in initial applications um, could you scroll up a little bit, Linda, right there on line two? The initial applications are moving from, deadline is moving from October 1st to November 15th. That same change is made on page 16, I mean, page two, line 16, uh, where it says an addendum may be filed to the initial application on or before November 15th, November 20th. Similarly, on page three, line 19, the reference to the addendum and the application deadline for the addendum is changed from October 1st to November 15th. That takes you to page four and section B. You're now in the non-dairy agricultural producer program. Uh, before I look at the changes or review the changes, this section in previous drafts used to reference or used to amend the no net profit requirement and the definition or threshold for farmers markets to participate. It is no longer being amended in this section. It will be addressed in a, in a separate section. It's not that it's not being addressed. It's just being addressed in a separate section. So the change here is similar to the change in the dairy program that the application deadline is moving from um, October 1st <laughs> to November 15th. And then you get to section C. Uh, the, this is um, the reporting authority. Um, and then it becomes the pooling and reallocation authority as well. You'll see that the secretary is going to report on page five, lines five through seven, not about the individual programs and their status, but about all of the coronavirus relief fund assistance programs. Because after 
October 1st, the secretary is gonna be given the authority to reallocate or pool resources. If the secretary does that, the secretary should be reporting about all coronavirus relief funds and not just the individual programs. On page five, line 11, you'll see that there is a report back on October 1st uh, with the status of, of the accounting of any of the coronavirus relief funds remaining in those individual programs. And then on page five, line 17 and 18, if coronavirus relief funds appropriated to those individual programs remain unappropriated or unencumbered for award after expiration of the initial October 1st deadline, the secretary may reallocate or pool unappropriated coronavirus relief funds for award to eligible applicants. If additional funds are required to meet applicant needs under one or more of the programs. I have May on page six, um, line one highlighted because it could be a shall. You could direct the secretary to, you could mandate the secretary reallocate or pool those unappropriated funds, or you give the secretary discretion. I didn't really have um, certainty about what you wanted to do there. So I just highlighted the May. Uh, Michael, uh, if, if we leave the May in there, wouldn't that, wouldn't that allow, or maybe we've got it, because I brought this up the other day uh, about a second round of applicants uh, applying for losses, um, and would this may allow, would it allow the secretary to keep some money in the given funds so that if somebody wanted to reapply uh, for more losses, they could, or we got that, is that in there somewhere else? Cause we talked about that. I, I think it would give this, it may gives the secretary that discretion um, the language that we talked about last week about ensuring that funds remain in each program fund, that was troublesome to, to Steve and the agency. Um, but I think you still address that issue on page six, lines 10 uh, through 13, if the secretary reallocates or pools funds, they apply the eligibility requirements and maximum award amounts for each category or type of application as if the application was submitted under the relevant individual fund. So even if the secretary reallocates, all of the eligibility requirements apply and the maximum award amounts apply as well. Um, yeah, that that will do the that will do it. I, I will note that there there may be because the non dairy program and the working lands program are first come first serve as opposed to the dairy program, which was designed to to fund all dairy farmers. There might be some fiscal pressure on the pooled fund if this demand from mm -hmm. non dairy and working lands is significantly higher than estimated in the fiscal note. Um, but I think, I think you have a, a, an opera because the, the demand on dairy has not been as vigorous as expected. I think you won't have that much of a fiscal pressure on a reallocated or pooled fund. No, the main thing is to get, get all the money out to our rural communities and to our farm families, um, regardless of what type of farming they're doing. Yep. Um, so uh, that allows you to go to section D, uh, which is at the bottom of page six, line 14. The secretary shall process all applications for, for coronavirus relief assistance received prior to the effective date in the order the application was received. Applicate, applicants who submitted applications prior to the effect, effective date shall not be required to refile an application. So somebody filed uh, an application 
um, prior to the effective date of this act, which is going to be around October 1st uh, for the non-dairy program. And then the secretary reallocates or pools funds. The applicant doesn't need to, to resubmit an application. Does just, that make sense? Uh, well, would they just apply through an addendum to their application of additional losses? Well, if they were going to submit for additional losses, then they would do an addendum to their initial application. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then on page seven, if the secretary elects to reallocate or pool the funds, the secretary shall process applications received on or before October 1st uh, and the order received and shall issue awards from the program fund for which each application was submitted. So people that apply prior to October 1st for the individual programs get processed under those programs. They're not gonna be lumped together. It's an equity and fairness issue. They applied according to those eligibility requirements, et cetera. Um, but I have some, we gotta talk about one thing with regard to that in page seven, line 14. Um, notwithstanding, oh, now let's go to page seven, line six. Notwithstanding uh, the acts and resolves of uh, Act 137, which was the ACCD Coronavirus Relief Fund uh, assistance programs, the money that was appropriated to the Working Lands Board shall not revert to ACCD on November 15th if unencumbered. Instead, the funds appropriating to Working Lands shall remain available for award until the reversion required under 2020 Acts and Resolves Number 137, Section. Yeah. Um, subdivision three four so it's it's not reverting to accd it's gonna just revert under the general rever reversion to ui on december 20th hopefully working land spends all of that money prior to december 20th <clears throat> well i think has anybody been in contact uh, have you or or steve uh, with anyone uh, from ACCD to, uh, you know, to get their blessings on this, um, thinking that, you know, we could use the argument that a lot of these non-dairy uh, ag producers won't know if they've made money or lost money until the end of the season. Uh, which is, you know, from now, now on through the fall, um, where they're selling their produce and products. Um, we could use that certainly as a legitimate reason for keeping it in the working lands program so we can cover those losses. And I don't so Bob, I, Bob, I, Bob yeah. is dead. No, Bobby, I, I asked that question and Steve answered it and said that because we have an MOU with him, uh, with them, that he thought that it could be worked out. And I don't know if Steve wants to comment at this moment. Um, trying. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. So I, I, I do think we, we've obviously been in contact with ACCD a lot about these programs. I don't think we've specifically asked about this reversion, but the reversion was in there as a fail safe to allow spending the money. And I know that ACCD is supportive of what we're trying to do here. And also they're supportive of being able to give grants to sole proprietors through their own program. So I really, I have not specifically asked this question, but I do not think it's a problem at all. ACCD is working with us. They also have an interest in the working lands board. And I think they support in general, getting the money out to the community that needs it. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, so, sure. Rep Representative Shannon. Uh, I, I, my question was answered by by Steve Collier. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. Bobby, Bobby yeah. is Bobby. Should we should we ask or request um, that Steve talk with them just to kind of double check so that we're not on the floor with some kind of um, snafu at the last second. Um, yeah, I think I think Steve will do that, um, or or the secretary can call the secretary uh, 
But as long as they're in concert with this, we're good to go. Uh, absolutely. So I had a question. Yes. Thank you. So I'm just wanting to make sure, since we heard um, about the software and the fact that it's not necessarily um, easy to change, if someone has an addendum to their situation and they don't need to reapply, I just want to make sure that there's already software in place that will allow them to do that without having to do the whole thing all over again. And I, I think it's important that we think about that ahead of time rather than get in another situation where someone needs to do an addendum and then all of a sudden it's, it's problematic because of the software. Have you, Michael, have you chased that down, that particular question? Um, the I, think that, I think asking Steve that question, um, I, 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 I'd I rather if that Steve respond to that question. I could, but I think Steve's the best one. Yeah. So, so good morning again. And that's a great question, Senator Collimore. And <laughs> here's the threshold issue is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but as I understand the S351 as written, every applicant is limited to a single application, except for dairy, which can file an addendum. There's nothing that I'm aware of elsewhere in the act that would allow anyone else to file an addendum. So I think if we are envisioning allowing people to come back in for additional losses, expenses, except for that single addendum and dairy that already exists, we do need to change the legislation. And that does create programming issues. As an example, with dairy, we first created the application. We then are working on the addendum. The addendum is not even up and running yet. It's close to it but it is a separate process to allow people in the back in the door. And we've been talking about this issue in the agency and we want people back in the door, but we have all of those programming concerns that we've already um, discussed. So that, that is an issue. Thank you. <laughs> and that's exactly why I asked the question. I appreciate that you've already thought ahead like that. And one of the reasons you push back the, no, the October 1st deadline to November 15th is to allow those, those non-dairy and, uh, and other applicants to, to basically accrue more eligible expenses that they can apply for. Um, so when they apply, they, they can get all of their economic loss. Yeah, uh, Ruth. Thanks, Bobby. Um, Michael, I, you didn't finish going through the bill, did you? Or the No, I did, and I, and oh, I, 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 I do have a point that I need to make. Yeah, I was. I I'm I'm going to let you make that point because I bet it's what I'm going to ask about. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, so looking on page seven, line fourteen, um, there was a discussion about how to deal with the no net business profit for the non dairy applicants, uh, and additionally for the W two. So. This says that it's the intent of the General Assembly that eligible applicants under the non-dairy ag program that had a net business profit between March 1, 2020 and August 1, 2020 shall be reviewed for eligibility for assistance through the Coronavirus Relief Fund, Working Grants Program, or by the Secretary, Secretary under any pooling of funds, and that the criteria of no net business profit shall not be applied as the sole criteria for disqualifying an applicant for Coronavirus Relief Fund assistance. So the, I actually have two points here. The first is I probably should have not withstood the no net business profit requirement in the non-dairy program so that it's clear that you don't want that to apply and it would not apply uh, underneath the application of the law with the notwithstanding. The next point is the W-2 issue is not addressed. Um, and although ACCD and um, the co House Commerce have proposed that, that it be removed and that sole proprietors be allowed. There's nothing in the language that addresses the W-2 issue. You're kind of just relying on the agency to address that uh, in their application program. And so th those are the two points I have on this language. Uh, likely. So, so would you like to uh, 
put that resolve um, back in there, uh, Michael. Uh, I, I'd like to put a notwithstanding clause in. Yeah. And then the question for you is how do you want to address the W-2 issue? Do you want to leave it to the agency uh, in their um, coordination with ACCD? Or do you want to have a statement in here about sole proprietors being eligible? Um, well, we certainly have a lot of uh, sole proprietors in ag. Uh, I, I don't know if that, that should be addressed, I would think, but we want to be in sync with ACCD on how they're going to do that as well, because I know um, uh, House Commerce in, in the House wants to address that issue so these sole proprietors can, you know, there are small mom and pops all over the state and, and we thought we were helping them, or at least I thought we were helping them right from the get go. And then that gets in there and I think everybody is trying to fix that. Uh, there are comments from other members. Yeah, um, Bobby, I just want to go back to, and Michael, that's exactly what I was going to ask about was the notwithstanding. So thank you for addressing that. Um, I do think we should specifically address the sole proprietors in this legislation, um, just to make sure we're covering the bases because Bobby's right, there are a lot of sole proprietors in ag. That, and then the other question I wanted to ask you about is on line 19, um, 19 and 20, that the criteria of the no net business profit shall not be applied as the sole criteria for disqualifying. Would that mean that it could be one of two criteria that disqualify an applicant or, or, or what do you intend with the using the word sole there? Uh, that's, that's a good point. I, I, I didn't really want it to be used as any criteria for disqualifying. Um, so I think uh, it, taking out the words, the sole shall not be applied as criteria for disqualifying an applicant. I think that's probably more consistent with your intent. Okay, great. I agree. Thanks. Um, can I ask a, a question right here just to, for clarification regarding the W-2s? Um, is that W-2 a federal requirement for the COVID money? Uh, not to my understanding. Okay, great. So is, is uh, Steve still on? Yes, Senator, I'm here. Yeah, have you got any problems with, with Michael's suggestion uh, on those two changes? Well, uh, thank you for the question. It just, we talked talk to the House Committee last week, but have not talked to the Senate Committee. So just let me briefly say, we want to do all these changes. Our concerns are being able to do them timely because of the limited time. We're estimating two to four weeks to implement any application changes. And if we can't make those until October 1st and there's an application deadline of November 15th, that becomes very problematic. So I think why Mike put, and I may be wrong, but I think why you put sole criteria is that already the profit bar doesn't exist for anyone except for a sole proprietor who does not have a W-2 employee who, who made a profit. And the reason I say that is the S-351 funds, the non-dairy ag producer funds, only they barred somebody with a profit, but if you didn't have a profit, everyone was in. There's no W-2 requirement for that, for those funds. So, the, so what we did with the working lands money was we, we, didn't, we wanted people who had a profit to be able to recover. So if you had a profit, you were bumped to the working lands money. But working lands had this W-2 one employee requirement. So the only person right now who's not eligible is the profitable sole proprietor. So because that's already in the case, if we take away the W-2 requirement from working lands, there is no profit bar anymore. And it's easier for us to change our application, we think, for the W-2 requirement, because we think we can do that on the back end, or we're hoping we can do that on the back end of the application. What I mean by that is we could still ask the question, do you have a W-2 employee? But then we could just ignore it in the programming so that it wouldn't have any significance. The, the profit 
piece asking about a profit, we're not, because of the way the application is interdependent, meaning that the if you have a profit, you go to one source of funds. If you don't, you go to the other. The application is built upon itself to funnel people without their knowledge necessarily to the right piece. So we're worried that changing the profit equation in the application will be a lot more complicated because it will change where the funds come from. So I, I think our point is, if you allow the pooling and you get rid of the W-2 requirement, there is no effective profit bar. And so that's easier, we think, on the application end than taking out the profit quotient as well. Yeah. Right, but I, I don't think you need to change the application because say you don't pool the money, it says that they, they, the, the net profit applicant shall be reviewed for eligibility under working land. And then it says, if you do pool the money, it's not going to be used as a criteria to disqualify the applicant. So you, you don't need to change the application because if you pool the money, you just treat them as if they're applying under the working lands program, right? Well, right now they're, they're asked if they have a profit. And so that's in the application. And right, if they but, but you then funnel them to working lands. Correct. If they have a profit, yes. Right. And so you would do the same thing underneath the pooled money, right? You would just say, oh, they have a net profit, but we're going to treat them as if they're applying under working lands. That's true if we pool all of the money. But remember, this everything is staying status quo up right. till October 1st. And, and all applications filed by that date are being processed that way. And so we, right. we might run out of money before we, there may not be any money left in one of the other funds by the time we even get to that point. So right. we're, we're trying to create as much flexibility as possible to make sure we can spend all the money. And I, I guess that's my point. Yeah, and, and <laughs> my, my, my question is, you, you, just, you just said if you take away the W-2, then, then it takes away the profit bar, right? It takes away the, the only existing bar that there is. So, so should that go away? Um, beginning October 1st. I'm sorry, the W-2 part, should that go yeah. away? Yeah, beginning October 1st. Well, if the law changes, then yes, I think it will have to, and that does require an application change. We're just hopeful that that change, be, because we think we can do it on the back end, will be relatively seamless. So then the question for the committees is whether or not they want to reference the W-2 criteria in this language? Well, <clears throat> that may be a question for us, but and we I think we're all in agreement with this, but we don't want to have everything kicked out uh, because we've taken it out or, but you said, I think you said, Michael, it doesn't seem to matter if we leave that in or take it out. It, according to Ruth's question, uh, that that isn't really a criteria uh, with um, the feds. So uh, we just got to make it workable for the ag uh, agency to be able to move forward. So I, I, think, I think Steve's concern is the application because um, until they're certain that the W-2 provision is no longer required by ACCD, they probably need to keep the application in its current state. And then when they know that the, the W-2 requirement is definitely going away, they're gonna have to change the application. So that means that it's probably gonna be after October 1st when the application will change. Um, and so prior to October 1st, the application isn't changing. The eligibility requirements haven't changed. There's still gonna be potentially a profit, but there's gonna be a bar for that profitable sole proprietor um, underneath working lands. So I think that that's, I think that's the concern. Did I summarize that correctly, Steve? You're still gonna yes. have that issue up, up until 
the application has changed. Rod, Rodney, did you have a question? Yes. Um, it's, if I remember right, when you look at the flow chart for the non-dairy programs, the, when you get down to the W-2 question, it says you can claim yourself, and if you claim yourself, it lets you go through. So is, is there actually, does that actually work, or what's the... <laughs> The, uh, yes, you can. You can be. You can claim yourself uh, uh, as a W two if you've been paying payroll taxes for yourself. Um, if you haven't, yeah. and you haven't been treating yourself as a W two employee, you you would not qualify. No. All right. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, did you have a question? Um, I do. Thank you, Senator Starr. Um, I'm, I'm recalling that it was um, clarified in the last joint hearing that the, the definition of net profit isn't necessarily what some people have understood it to be, meaning that um, total revenue exceeds total expenses, um, but the definition of net profit would allow people um, to consider accrual, amortization, depreciation so that I'm thinking that if the application itself is being managed by the website company, are we doing the rest of the, we're, we're doing the rest of the website in house. And so there could be a place that people have to go to before they can get into that application. And if that's managed in house, maybe this information can be disseminated clearly there so that the agency can be more nimble and responsive and deal with this so that people understand this before they go into the application and um, can, instead of saying, oh no, I made a net profit, can say, well, actually, if I consider these things, I can say that I did not make a net profit and I'm still eligible. Um, well, just well, the, a question. The agency has a as a as, as a pretty good, if not really good, um, document that steps the applicant through the application, and it's separate. It's basically a separate document that like gives you guidance on how you're going to fill out the application. I don't recall how net profit is defined underneath that document. Um, I think that's really the core of your question, Representative Fagard, is is whether or not. There's enough information in that document about how a person calculates net profit. Mm -hmm. And um, to make sure that they see it before they get to the application so that they've, yeah. they've had a, they've, it's necessary for them to actually see that information before they go in and, and perhaps make themselves ineligible. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Ruth, did you put your hand up? Yeah, yeah, I did, but Chris has had his hand up longer, so I'm going to defer to him I, now. I must not be on your screen, Mr. Chair. Oh, well, now you I switch. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I'd just like to weigh in and say for sure we should make it clear about the W-2 question in our own bill and not be dependent on a different bill advancing that covers everybody. I, I hope we're in agreement there. My question is, is there any wisdom to making it clear, or maybe someone could comfort me that it's already clear that somebody who's tried to apply already and basically got discouraged by the net profitability question could come back or maybe even have the agency reach out and signal that they could come back. We, we just have such a, a, a time crunch in the moment when these, these folks are so busy anyway, that I, I want to make sure we're not inadvertently, you know, sending people away when we're actually working hard to bring them back. So, uh, somebody from the agency or Michael, can you answer that? Good morning. I can if you'd like. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Could I ask? I just want to clarify. You said if they've been discouraged from applying, so they actually haven't applied. Well, that's an, a separate question, but uh, no, if they have started to apply and then 
you know, they, they had a profit, so they went to working lands and suddenly they didn't have a W-2 and so they're out, you know, what, what uh, I, I just wonder about people that we haven't uh, been able to help that would be eligible after October 1st, if this is in the law. I think that's a question for the agency. So Steve, do you have an answer to Chris's um, concern? Sure, uh, Senator Pearson, that's a gr great question. And absolutely people, the, the only bar is you can only apply once. So if you haven't submitted, if you haven't actually applied, then you're still eligible to apply. And that would be, and obviously we, we've been trying to promote this continuously as we go, but we would also want to promote any changes because that's our only objective is to get all the money out. And on that point, I actually have something I'd like to raise at some point, but I don't need to do it now if, um, so anyway. Well, if it's going in this piece of legislation, it better come up pretty soon. <laughs> if you, if, if you, if you'll um, allow me, I can raise it right now. Uh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So it's actually something that Mike had raised with us earlier, which is a great point, And that is about the possibility that Congress may extend the coronavirus relief fund deadline to give us after December 30th. And so recognizing that you won't be in session a lot longer, I think it would be terrific if we could add a proviso to this legislation that if Congress extends the deadlines, that that would allow us to extend the application deadlines so people would have even more time to apply and also the reversion deadlines to whatever Congress enacts it because you won't be around to fix it arguably, uh, especially if the current deadline is November 15th but it would be a shame to lose that money. And I think it's a fairly easy contingency fix. I, I thought, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought the uh, powers to be were, was gonna have a, a statement in the major portion of that bill or in the first part of the main bill uh, to take care of that situation. Uh I, I, I think that's correct. I think, Steve, it, I, it really depends on what vehicle this language travels on. If it goes in the larger CRF corrections bill, there's going to be a, a extension provision slash reversion provision in, in that bill. If it goes into another bill that doesn't have that default, you should probably include the language as part of this language as well. It, it really depends on what vehicle it's going to travel on. Yeah, well, I've been told, and that's why we're pushing to get this done, that this was going to get forwarded to the, uh, to the Appropriations Committee, which is doing the overall bill like they did before, um, to, to include this with just one bill. They were going to include the whole thing. Right, and I was I was supposed to take a shot at drafting some of that language on Friday afternoon, but um, some drama arose around the the social equity for immigrants bill, and I had to do some drafting on that. <laughs> Ruth, did you have a question? Um, well, I just wanted I, I I note again that Michael hasn't gone through all the language, so there's still some leftover stuff regarding farmers markets. So I wanted to hear his walk through of that section if we, before we run out of time. Uh, so right now we're gonna Chris ask- also has something that he wants to say. <laughs> well, I, I, I got an unsatisfying answer, not that it wasn't an accurate answer about the idea that somebody's applied, they were rejected. Now we're changing the criteria. It sounds like maybe we've even barred them because people have only been able to apply once and I'd like to see us make it clear that if we have now let you in under the new criteria, but you failed to get in prior, uh, you'd be allowed to re-up. And I, 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 I can't imagine that we wouldn't do that. So I wanna make sure we don't let that slip. Senator Starr, this is Allison. May I um, reply to Senator Pearson on that, please? Yeah, sure. So I'm sorry I don't have video. Boys are home their first day of school and it's um, cutting out. So I apologize for that. I've been trying to raise my hand. It lets me give a thumbs up and clap. So I can't raise my hand. 
Um, so I just, a couple of things. I know that our team is meeting today at 11 o'clock with MTX and we will be asking about that question. It is on the list. Uh, wondering if we can clear out the ineligible applicants um, or have folks re-register with a new username. Um, we also have been inquiring on whether they have a list of those uh, readily available for us on um, the applicants that have been uh, deemed ineligible. So hopefully we'll have more answers for you um, as it relates to that question. One other piece that I just wanted to put in there, unrelated, but I think related in the sense that uh, the agency does take this you know, serious and we do want to see all apply that can apply. And last week, um, there was a testimony given by two applicants. Um, I can't remember Amanda's last name, but also, also um, Vershire Beef. And our team did reach out to both of those witnesses and have a conversation with them. So we're, we're not only watching um, those that come before your committees, but we're also wanting to get in touch with those that are deemed ineligible. We'll do our best to make sure everybody gets money that's uh, available to get it. Thank, thank you, Allison. Uh, Chris, uh, did, did that take care of your concerns or? Glad it's on the list, thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, we've got about five more minutes as senators have because we've got to be on the floor, um, you know, like 20 after uh, nine. Um, so Michael, you want to finish up? Um, sure, so on page eight, um, remember there was uh, the concern raised by some of the farmers markets and by NOFA that because they did not have $10,000 in annual gross sales that they would not qualify for the non-dairy program. Yeah. And, the, and when you originally addressed that question, you would have changed the application for the non-dairy program, which the agency said raised concerns regarding the MTX application. So instead, what, what you are doing is you're creating a, a separate farmers market relief assistance program for those farmers markets that have less than $10,000 in annual gross sales. Um, you would appropriate an, an additional $250,000. So this is not coming from the money that was already appropriated. Um, an additional 250,000 for the purpose of awarding grants to farmers markets in the state that have suffered verifiable lost revenues or expenses caused by COVID-19. And then you'll see to be eligible, you have to have annual gross sales of less than $10,000 and that they shall demonstrate to the agency lost revenues or expenses that occurred or accrued on or after March 1, 2020 and before November 1, 2020 due to COVID-19. Um, the agency shall award the grants equitably to all eligible farmers markets in the state. That's similar to what you did for ag fairs. And the agency shall transfer any amounts appropriated for this purpose that remain both unencumbered and unspent as of December 1, 2020 to the agency of agriculture for um, award uh, underneath those programs you just went through, the dairy, non-dairy, working lands, or any pooled or reallocated funds. Um, so that's the farmer's market language. But I thought I thought there was only like 14 or 15 farmer markets. No, there's closer to uh, 60 to 70, 50. You know, the, the number I've heard ranges between 50 and 70. 50 to 70? Yeah. Correct. And how many of them gross less than $10,000? I mean. Uh, probably most. Most? Right. It's because it's the farmer's market itself. It's not the people that are selling at the farmer's market. Um, uh, boy, we go and ask for another 250 grand. It's going to be pretty rough sledding, isn't it? Uh, that, that, that's, that's, your, uh, that's probably you're the best person to opine on that. I was well, thinking the same thing, Bobby. I wondered where that m number came from. I don't recall us talking about an additional no. appropriation here. <laughs> Uh, well, I, uh, I think I you, 
I'm sorry. What I would put in there, Michael, I mean, I, I'm thinking out loud now because this is cold turkey, but I would think that after a certain day, date, if there were funds still available that give the agency the authority to, um, to appropriate uh, on an equitable basis to these smaller farmer markets from the from the grand total of all the funds or something. Sure, I can I can draft language like that. There, Would, there was a there was a chat from Abby Willard saying that there's 13 winters mark for farmers markets. Just FYI. Yeah. Well, well this this isn't limited to the winters farmers markets. No, I understand, but they're more likely to make more money. Uh, if they're open also in the winter than just the summer. Well, I, you know, I think it's important that we recognize the importance of these farmer markets and that we get some <laughs> assistance to them. Um, you know, we maybe messed up in the beginning by putting that limit at $10,000 uh, and we should try to correct that, but to go back to the to the well and try to get another two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I think is going to be problematic. And and we ought to figure out a system where if we have money left in our kitty, uh, you know, at a given date, uh, then allow the agency to to um, move forward and fund them to in an equitable and fair way. Is that agreeable with, with folks? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn, is, is that yeah, okay? I, I think so. What was the original number that was uh, given to the farmer's market? Was that 500,000? Uh, uh, no, this is the first number that you've seen or the farmer's market originally were eligible under the non-dairy program, which okay. had over. You might be thinking about the fairs, Carolyn. Yep, right. yep, you're right, you're right. Thanks, Brian, yeah. Yep. So, so I, this actually brings up another question and I know senators have to leave for the floor momentarily. The house is gonna um, stay on because um, I think, and I also think that we will probably meet tomorrow as we're scheduled to do at 8.30. Hopefully Michael can join us and we can go through, maybe the language will be more uh, firmed up by then. Um, but I've also had, speaking of farmer's markets, I also had an inquiry from a friend and constituent who actually uh, manages one of the larger farmer's markets in the state and, you know, regarding what's going to happen with them. So I don't want to change the sub subject here while you all are on. Um, I noticed also that John O'Brien's had his hand up for quite a long time. But um, I think we need to actually think about the farmers markets and what, what's going to happen when they need to move indoors. So but I, I don't want to rush uh, anybody, but we are running out of time. Could, could we meet? Um, could we meet at nine o'clock tomorrow morning to, as a joint crew, to try to get this this tail end figured out? And Michael could, could get that notwithstanding language in in the bill. Yeah, well, Bobby, that's what I was just suggesting that potentially we 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 have our already scheduled eight thirty to ten thirty meeting tomorrow morning. So. If you want to hop on to that with us whenever you can, that would be fine. Um, <clears throat> and maybe the the language will be a little bit more finalized at that point. Yeah, could could the senators meet at nine tomorrow morning? Or eight thirty even. Yep. Uh, I I can possibly make it for eight thirty. I've got a meeting in Newport at eight o'clock, but it's oh. a short short meeting. You'd have to be uh, real short. <laughs> well, maybe those that can make it just show up at 8.30. That's 
That good, uh, Chris? He's nodding yes. Well, we'll yeah. we'll plan on eight thirty then. Um, you know, their belt. So, uh, Carolyn, maybe you guys can work to try to get that squared away a little bit better. Okay, yeah, Bobby, I, a couple, a few hands are up. So we're gonna stick with it now as you guys leave and um, we'll see um, we'll see where we get. Uh, okay, and we'll see you back tomorrow morning at 8.30 or so. Sounds good, thanks. Yeah, thank you. See thanks, you guys. Bob. It's good working with you. Yeah. I mean, all of you. Yeah, <laughs> bye. bye. Thanks. Um, so, John, you had your hand up. Um, do you want to ask your question at this point, or have you forgotten actually what it was? Right. My question is, how do I get to ask a question? Um, <clears throat> no, I think there's a question in here somewhere, which was that if all the all these CRF funds um, applying to, to ag businesses, right? They have to show either economic harm or COVID related retrofits to businesses, right? <clears throat> Just to, at the, at, that's universal. That's correct. Okay, so what we learned from testimony with the non-dairy people was that, you know, during that window of application, some of these businesses just, the accounting methods they're using were showing profits, even though their, their businesses were getting hammered and they may go out of business by the end of the year or, or soon. So I was wondering if we change the accounting methods for those potential net profit people, does that, what, what we're gonna take into account so that, that the economic harm, say for the last year that they've been suffering will be shown, would that affect the dairy farmers and processors, um, the, the way they apply also, because it seems that um, the way their, their accounting is gone might, might be different if, if we're changing it for everybody else. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I do. Um... I don't know if you're necessarily changing any accounting. Um, the Federal CARES Act is the one that put the condition on the funds need to be costs or expenses related to COVID-19. So the applicant needs to show that. Um, so if you take away the net profit criteria or have them being funneled into working lands, I don't think there is that net profit issue anymore. And then it's just about them demonstrating their economic losses or expenses related to COVID-19, which for example, dairy is doing by use of what they're being paid for their, for their milk versus what was expected to be paid. Um, and so, um, I don't know if you need to change the accounting method at all. And I defer to the agency to see if they have any input on that question. I guess it would just be <clears throat> if, if some of those non-dairy businesses had whatever made them show on their spreadsheet, a net profit, um, and they were getting kicked out because of that, even though there was real economic harm there, either you know pre pre March or post October first. Um, would would potential dairy farmers you know have the same sorts of um, economic harm on either side of that window that they could then roll into their application? I see what you're saying. It's just if you if you incurred the costs outside of the window, but it was related to COVID, can you, and because of your accounting practices, it's not being accounted for in the window, can you count it? Right. So, so um, when I applied, there is an opportunity, after you get through your profit and loss statements, there's an opportunity to talk about economic harm. 
I included the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, which was in May. So it was part of my profit and loss, which can be clearly, um, clearly demonstrated. But it also allows you to claim, and, and I did, the New York Sheep and Wool Festival, which is in October. I was able to upload, download the, um, the message, the email message saying that it had been canceled. And I can't remember when it was canceled, but it was a while ago. And, 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 you're, and I, so I included that as part of my loss. So it wasn't in the current window, but it was allowed to be noted. I don't know if that helps or not, but. Um, I, I think that's not exactly the same question. Okay. Because there you could show the demonstrated loss and it, I, I, I don't, I don't remember what time you said the New York festival was, but if it was Third in, week the, in October. Okay. Um, so Steve, do you have any answer to that? <laughs> I can try. <laughs> So I think there are two different things at issue. One is the federal law requires, it only covers necessary expenditures or losses that occur from March 1st to December 30th. So that's the allowed time. We, and we allow that, I think our legislation S-351, I think maybe set up until December 1st instead of right. December 30th. Mm -hmm. But either way, our application has always preceded that. So right now it's October 1st. So we at the agency made a judgment call that we couldn't allow losses that occurred prior to the application date because they couldn't be adequately proven. So it just became too speculative to try to assess what somebody's December losses may be when they haven't occurred yet. The issue that the chair just raised about a festival we made that's canceled, we made, and that this arose from the fairs application initially because some of the fair, that, that timeline Again, the federal law remained the same up, till, up through December 30th, but the fairs deadline was September 1st, if I recall correctly. And some of the fairs like Tunbridge occurred after September 1st. So in that instance, we made the judgment call that, that the actual date of loss was not when the fair would have occurred or in the chair situation when the sheep festival would have occurred, rather it was when the event was canceled. And so, if you could prove what you, what, if you could prove your losses based on past revenue and the event was canceled prior to the deadline, then we allowed it. But other than that, we've only allowed people to claim losses that have actually occurred because we think it's too speculative to project what may or may not happen before somebody's applied. So that, does that answer your question, Representative O'Brien? Or So, could, is it possible to use your, say your 2019 um, you know, whether it's your 1040 or your profit and loss at, as, a, <clears throat> as a, also as a bar, you know, to, to demonstrate 2020 economic COVID losses? Y yes, there are, we, we tried to be as flexible as possible in how people could prove their losses. So we've, generally speaking, the framework is you look at the month in, in this year, 2020, and compare it to the same month in 2019, that's not always the case. For example, with milk prices, we, and, and you all enabled this through the legislation, we compared the January rate because that was the known rate of milk and the projections were actually for milk prices to increase, but instead they precipitously dropped. So we need some kind of barometer from the past to look at what they should have earned. Generally, it's the preceding year's month, but sometimes a business may not have been around that long. You know, a business may have opened in January, and so that that becomes more complicated. So yes, we need we need something to show what you lost, but in generally it's the before. Okay. All right, Sharon's hand is up. Unless somebody had a follow up to what Steve just said. <clears throat> Go ahead, Sharon. Um, thank you. Um, and I, I, I thought I heard. Um, Representative O'Brien talking about dairy, whereas dairy doesn't have to show that they didn't make a net profit. They, you know, their accounting is so different from what we're expecting from the non-dairy sector that 
I think I remember somebody saying all the applicants that they've had come through have maxed out, like that they're getting the full amount available through the bill, which is one reason why we wanted to be able to give dairy more. Um, but, but my question is, I, I wanna clarify and make sure I understand the farmer's market piece um, where it makes sense to not try to get into a new bundle of money coming in in order to support the farmer's markets. Um, did I understand that the, the general thought is that at the October 1 deadline that we start allowing farmer's markets access to that money? Um, I, I didn't catch when the deadline, but I, I think what I heard is that when the money is pulled and the agency has flexibility, um, that then these farmers markets that currently are not not eligible because they don't meet the ten thousand dollar mark would then have be considered and they can apply and it would be through they would end up getting shuffled into the like the we lab pot is that correct uh somewhat and somewhat no okay um i i think it would probably make sense to have uh, the money that's unexpended after October 1st to have language that says if there's money remaining, um, 250,000 uh, will be allocated to the program that's created under section F of the language that I gave. Um, uh, the it would not be part of WeLab. It would be a separate program similar to the Ag Fairs program. It would not be processed through MTX. It would be processed through the agency's, um, I don't know if their normal application process. Uh, Abby Willard talked a little bit about that last week and about how um, they could do that. Timing might be a little bit tight, but they think they could do it in the same manner that they did the Ag Fairs application um so did that answer your question i think so um and i wanted to share that i stopped by uh, the richford farmers market this weekend um to check in on them and just to to hear from a very small farmers market that's been around for 28 years um how the pandemic has affected them and it it has they have losses for sure and they did not know that um that there was a possibility that federal money could be accessible to them. So, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're providing relief for those, those organizations. Thank you. So just to be clear, the farmer's market money was going to come from the non-dairy ag um, pot of money, right? So originally farmers markets were going to be and still are eligible underneath non-dairy if they have $10,000 of annual gross sales. The issue is that many, if not most farmers markets don't have $10,000 in annual gross sales, but still have losses or expenses related to COVID-19. Right. The language that I handed out this morning, the $250,000 would not have come from any of the existing ag assistance programs. It would have been a new appropriation from the overall coronavirus relief fund. And that's when Senator Starr said it would be difficult to get that money. Let's try another option that went on a certain date if there's money that's available from the previous appropriations that that money would be transferred to this program for farmers markets that make less than $10,000 in annual gross sales. Uh, yeah, <coughs> and I agree with him that it might be difficult to come up with that extra money. And I'm just wondering if, if all we did was to remove the requirement to, um, uh, to gross ten thousand dollars how would that play you know just it would come out of the, the money that there's there i don't know and i don't know what the status is at this moment for the money that's available and i don't know steve if you can answer this or allison or abby but or laura 
uh, or Anson, <laughs> thank you for being with us. Um, but what impact would that have on the, um, the what's in there now for the non-dairy ag if we just took the requirement for the $10,000 out? Well, the, the issue there was, was not the availability of funding. The issue was having to change the application further. Yeah. Um, and the timing and delay that that would yeah. cause. Yeah. And the equity issue as well. Yeah. Okay. Just thinking outside the box, John. Yeah. Just a quick question. How, how in general do farmers markets make their money? Is it on selling vendor booths or, or percentage of, of farmers sales? I, I don't know. Is Abby still on the line? Hi, Abby. Good morning. Yeah, Abby Willard, Agency of Agriculture. Generally, it's vendor fees, Representative O'Brien. So what we're hearing from the farmer's market community is that we generally have about 70 farmer's markets a year. This year, it looks like 55 or so, partially because some markets are struggling to find a space that was authorized to host their market due to COVID. So there's some markets that haven't even been initiated this year or are definitely already scheduling. Two markets have already decided to not host winter farmers markets. So normally we have around 15 winter farmers markets. This year it looks like we'll have 13. So the numbers fluctuate with the number of farmers markets each year based upon the community and the organization of the market. Because they're so often managed by a part-time, very part-time or sometimes volunteer market manager, the association itself oftentimes isn't a very profitable organization other than what they receive in vendor fees. Because at the beginning of the spring, we actually limited the number of vendors that were able to market at a farmer's market and we originally restricted it just to essential food. There were a variety of vendors that weren't able to even legally vend at a farmer's market. So if you did fiber or soap or postcards, we said that those were not, in the beginning, not eligible essential needs at a farmer's market. We did amend that guidance so that then those vendors were able to participate, but we restricted the spacing between booths up to a, a space that then required many markets to have to reduce their um, vendor participants. And so by doing so, that meant that the vendor fees that most or many markets accepted was quite reduced for 2020. And then Representative um, Fagard, for, to, in regard to the market that you connected with, um, it is our goal to send, um, to have every market be aware of this opportunity. We do most of our marketing through farmers markets, uh, for, through, for farmers markets through NOFA and the Vermont Farmers Market Association. So NOFA has been identified in statute as the organization that sort of manages farmers market, which is why we get the final numbers from uh, NOFA as opposed to manage them at the agency. So that's what's written into statute. Um, and VTFMA membership does not necessarily include every farmer's market. So there are some markets that sometimes are just not as engaged in receiving resources and information and routine communication with the agency or with NOFA. But we can certainly do a better job to make sure that all markets are aware of this application. But we generally use the association and NOFA for the outreach. John O'Brien. So, did we ever hear, Abby, of the say sixty-six farmers markets? How how many of those fall under the ten thousand gross sales? Say, judging from last year's sales, and why yeah. did we cut them out? It's a great question. We didn't ask that of farmers markets. We essentially just promoted that the opportunity existed there and there was this base eligibility of the $10,000 in gross revenue. Um, Laura Ginsburg is on because she's actually managing more of the app on the application side. My recollection is, as we said, there's been three farmers markets that have applied to date and all three of them have met that $10,000 uh, gross revenue eligibility threshold. But as we mentioned, they were the, they're the larger markets. It was Burlington, Norwich, and Capital City and Montpelier. So there are certainly some small markets that may not meet. And it sounds like based on the testimony from NOFA, they are certain won't meet that threshold. But I, I, I can't say that we know 
of the 55 markets that plan to operate in 2020, how many of them will or will not meet that threshold. But that's a great question that we could um, ask for NOFA and the Vermont Farmers Market Association to assist us with in collecting that information. All right. Um, we have another few minutes, but not tons. Uh, we will meet tomorrow at 8.30. Um, I don't know how to crack this nut um, in terms of the farmers markets. Um, if Bobby if Bobby thinks it's gonna be difficult, he's the member of Approps um, to come up with the extra $250,000. But uh, Vicki, I see your hand is up. Why don't you go ahead? I think it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, a quick question, maybe Abby. Um, how much of a deal breaker would this grant be for a farmer's market? If, if they're making kind of less than 10,000, it's not a big amount of money. So could they just regroup for next year? So let's say it's a normal year. How many farmers markets would just kind of go kaput if they didn't get this money? Yeah, Representative Strong, it's a good question. I, I, and I don't know the answer, how many would choose to just close their doors if they didn't receive a $1,500 kind of grant, for example. Um, I think the biggest question that the agency and many of our partners have considered is when, when COVID first hit in March, the farmer's market reduction in local food sales um, estimates that came out was just under $2 million that would be lost by local ag producers um, between March and April by having those markets closed. So I think in general, farmers markets provide an incredible market opportunity and revenue for our ag and food um, businesses. And so what the loss will be to those businesses if particular markets close is also something that's very difficult to determine. Um, but I, but I, your questions um, are prompting me to start a email to the Farmers Market Association representative at NOFA to just ask how quickly could they get some statistics from markets on um, their intention to um, rely upon some COVID relief funds or um, how many of them may have above $10,000 in revenue. The challenge is this is a very difficult time to connect with farmers market managers because they're so busy. So generally we do the most work with the market managers over the winter when they have a little bit more capacity. And it's really tough during the, during the growing season and market season to kind of get a lot of information from them, but we can certainly try. Okay, so uh, what I'm hearing is the major problem here is the application. Um, okay, Anson, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would just add that keep in mind the dairy program. We've already baked that in that if everyone hits their cap, there is enough money in it. It's pretty clear that we're probably not everyone is going to either apply or hit their cap. So I believe there will be some money left over. So if you had to transfer a quarter of a million dollars into the farmer's market program. You know, I can't, I mean, we don't know. I mean, we've got, if you extend the deadline to November 15th, we don't know, but I'm, my gut tells me there will probably be a quarter of a million dollars left in dairy that could be transferred over to the farmer's markets. It's also, some have already applied through the regular funding. So those three that are through that, so that money is already baked in as well. So. I, I think if it's a if it's strictly a money issue, if there was some language where you could transfer um, some leftover dairy money, if there is leftover dairy money, which I think there's going to be, then you could use that 250000 for the farmer's market. And we could do it just like we did with the fairs and field days, because our biggest concern was sort of um, the application process. If we had to change the application, then that would cause delay of getting money out and, and et cetera. So just a thought. Okay. Michael, great. Oh, Abby's hand is up. Abby? Yeah, just really quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to the point that Anson's making, um, we have some early, very early analysis of the businesses in the Ag and Working Lands application, and maybe Laura Ginsburg can also speak to this, but um, businesses are hitting their cap because the caps are so low in the Ag and Working Lands application in comparison to, say, the dairy application. Um, so, you know, $2,500 is the lowest tier in the Ag and Working Lands application based upon um, 
uh, gross revenue from 2019. So it kind of begs a couple of questions. One, about the need for a supplemental application if businesses are all hitting their cap. We could go through all the effort to create an opportunity for those businesses that applied prior to September or October 1st to have access to a supplemental application. But if they've all hit their cap, then there's no value in a secondary supplemental application because they can't, unless we raise the caps or unless the legislature, you all decide to raise the caps, they, they aren't eligible for more funds anyway. And the same thing comes up around an equity question for us. <clears throat> As Anson mentioned with the fairs, we wanted to ensure that they were equitably dis distributed across the fairs. Um, right now, if farmers markets applied through the Ag and Working Lands application and they had annual revenue less than $10,000, they obviously would be ineligible, but there was, there's no way that they would make more than $2,500 per application because um, that's the cap for the lowest tier. And so something to really think about about the amount that markets would be eligible for in a carve out. So we had done the quick math in a previous conversation that 250,000 was like the maximum, but, but we might wanna think about aligning the caps between the Ag and Working Lands application and what the farmer's market application might also award. So just something mm -hmm. for us to think about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks Abby. All right, Sharon has her hand up and I think this has to be the last thing uh, before we break away to go to the floor of the house. So Sharon, go ahead. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, well, one of the vagaries of getting older. Um, all right. Um, okay. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank everybody from the agency. Uh, if you're available tomorrow, it might be helpful to have you on, on the line. Um, if you can, you know, let uh, Linda know. And um, Mike, I'm hoping you're going to be available uh, at 8.30 tomorrow. So um, anyway. Uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow at 8.30.